I wonder sometimes if the apostles ever got annoyed traveling around Jesus and hearing all the stories over and over again. People keep asking him straightforward questions. <laughs> Who is my neighbor? Okay, see, once upon a time there was this guy. Oh, great, it's story time with Joshua again. Here we go. Tell me he didn't bring the puppets. Did he leave the puppets at home? Oh, thank God he left the puppets. I think Jesus spoke in the stories, though, not to confuse his audience, but he knew somehow that he was speaking to audiences generations beyond the one he was speaking to in that moment. And that's one of his best stories there, the Good Samaritan, exemplifying who your neighbor is, expanding that idea, telling us we should love our neighbor as ourselves and who is our neighbor. See, there was this guy everybody hated. Oh boy, here we go. But it's an enduring story, and it's a story people have picked up for generations. And it's a story picked up by one of my favorite preachers of all time, Mr. Rogers. When I was five years old and starting in kindergarten, I started reading at a very young age. I was very precocious with my reading. So when I was five and in kindergarten, I would spend half my day moving ahead as into the six-year-old classroom with the, with the first graders to do my, my reading lessons because I was, I was way beyond where the, the kids in my kindergarten class were. And this kind of set me apart from the kids. Did not make me one of the popular boys in the class. I was not made friends with and I did not make friends easily with the kids my own age. And despite this talent that I had every right to feel very proud of, I felt very, very alone as a little kid. That there was something wrong with this thing that I could do that made me special and kind of made me stand out. I identified deeply with Charlie Brown as a little boy. <laughs> but I felt lonely. I felt, I, I had a hard time getting along with other kids. And I looked forward to getting out of school at the end of that half day and getting on the bus and running home and turning on my PBS station, WGBH in Boston. I was one of the lucky ones to get the big one. <laughs> you know, and Sesame Street was on and that was great and it was fun. The electric company was cool for a kid my age and it's so very, very dated now. But then, after all that was over, the music would start. It's a Oh, look, that was what we just sang. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, for me, was a retreat from all of the meanness and all of the smallness that I encountered in my world. Aha, there we go. I can press buttons. Mr. Rogers was a retreat from all the meanness and all the smallness that I encountered in my world. He was my friend, even though there was a television screen separating us, and at the age of five, there was nothing I wanted more than to just meet Mr. Rogers. None of the Red Sox, none of the Celtics. I wanted to meet Mr. Rogers and just sit down and read to him. Pull out one of my little golden books, because I knew he would appreciate what I had to offer in this moment, and I soaked him in, afternoon after afternoon, for I don't know how long. I was probably watching all of those PBS kids shows until 
far beyond most kids probably should, or at least are expected to. But eventually, eventually I outgrew. I outgrew Mr. Rogers. Eventually I came into teenagehood and all of the fun crap that comes along with that. And eventually I forgot the specifics of watching Mr. Rogers day after day after day. But I absorbed so much of what he had to teach. Fred Rogers' daily affirmation of the parable of the Good Samaritan over and over again in all of its forms, soaking into my heart and into my soul. And the songs, I remembered the songs. They would be earworms in the shower till, I mean, even today. <laughs> Just kind of sneaking up on you and jumping in there. I like you as you are. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm done for the day. That's my, that's my soundtrack. And then last year, the documentary Won't You Be My Neighbor arrived in the theaters last summer. I saw it twice, twice in a month. Because Nora wasn't with us the first time, so she had to come see it. So, oh darn, I had to go see this movie twice. And I'm sitting there watching the story of Mr. Rogers, and I'm just <laughs> weeping openly and uncontrollably every time, every single time. Friday night, third time I've seen it. <laughs> because I recognized so much of who I had become in everything he was teaching day after day, week after week, year after year, for as long as he did it. I recognized in, in, the, in all of my complex theological meanderings and my route to being here today were just the very simple seeds of that Good Samaritan parable carried out in all its iterations in the work of Fred Rogers over and over again. I saw who I had become because of him because of the lessons of the good neighbor. There are hundreds of lessons to be drawn from the life and the messages of Mr. Rogers. I will not give you all of them today, but I wanna give you some of the important ones. First and foremost, if I only had to give one sermon today, it would be this one. It is okay to feel what you feel. What an amazing, simple, and yet important message to give to a child, for one thing, and one that we so easily forget as adults and cast aside. I've got a cold. The good neighbor, teaches Mr. Rogers, does not demand my happiness, nor do I, as the good neighbor, demand happiness all the time from those around me. We are allowed to feel what we feel. I can be with you through all of your emotions, and you can be with me through all of mine. I do not need you to be happy, or indeed need not need to experience you in the absence of anger. That's one of the big lessons coming out of the story of Fred Rogers' life. He was a boy who was not allowed to express anger. Neither was his spouse, learning to deal with the anger that he felt in ways. And as he grew up, the sentence he used over and over again that he learned from his teachers in behavioral sciences with children was this, if it is mentionable, it is manageable. If we can name it, we can deal with it. And as a five-year-old, Mr. Rogers was naming everything I felt along the spectrum, giving words to all of this stuff going on inside. Being able to name it is a big deal, and we're so bad at it as grown-ups. Emotional intelligence is one of the lacking skills among so many of us. And so if there's one lesson I would ask us to all grasp onto again as adults, from our childhood, it is this, it is okay to feel what you feel. If you can name it, you can deal with it.
But that's not the only sermon for the day. Lesson number two, you are special. This is the one that gets people's undies in a bunch more than any other. <laughs> if we listen to the villain from The Incredibles, if everybody's super, nobody is. If everybody's special, nobody is. So how can you tell me I'm special? I'm, I'm going to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. I'm barely scraping by. You told me I was special, and I got to go to work every day. And I'm fighting with my friends and my family occasionally. And my kids aren't turning out perfect. And all of this stuff is going wrong. How could you have told me I was special? Mr. Rogers, in his commencement addresses to colleges when they would invite him, and I love that graduating seniors would invite Mr. Rogers to be their speaker. Doesn't that say a lot about what we're trying to reach back and grasp? Would say what he meant by telling every child that they were special was simply this. You do not have to be an amazing person. You do not have to do amazing things in order to be worthy of love, period. The good neighbor does not exact a price in exchange for the care, the concern, the compassion, the love that should be shown to each and every one of us simply because we are here and we're human. The good neighbor loves unconditionally. For Fred Rogers, it all starts with love, he would say. Every lesson begins with that love, how we are friends, how we parent, how we are family, how we are in community. The way of our being all begins with love if we are to be the good neighbor. And it follows then that if you are special, if you are worthy of love simply for being who you are, then you need to know that you are enough just as you are. The good neighbor accepts you for who you are. The good neighbor knows that you are more than just your one bad moment this morning when you accidentally stepped on their daffodils in the garden. When you slipped and yelled at your kid because you were having a frustrating morning and you're more than all of your best moments when it feels like you might be superhuman. Fred Rogers was more than that almost supernatural goodness that he projected all the time himself, and we'll get to that in the moment. You are enough as you are. You are more than just one thing. You are everything that makes you up, and that is a good thing. And how often do we forget that as grown-ups? How often do we go get so wrapped up in a definition of ourselves based on what we do for a living or where we go to church or what street we manage to buy a house on or what stores we get to shop on or where we get to go to on vacation or what our biggest mistake in life might have been or what our biggest regret might be. All of that makes us who we are and all of that is enough. And all of these basic, basic lessons feel like common sense, maybe, like they should be given, like we should just understand them innately and hold them in our hearts, that we shouldn't have to go on and on ad nauseum about them, John, while you're still talking about this. But another one of... Mr. Rogers' lessons is that it's good to talk about these things. It's good to talk about our feelings. It's good to name them so we can manage them. It's good to talk about how we are loved and how I think you are special and how I think you are enough and how we get together like that. 
it's good to talk about these things because the good neighbor communicates rather than prolonging any uncertainty we might feel in relationship with one another. One of the most awful things you could do to a child, Mr. Rogers said, was to leave them to the mercies of their own imaginations. Because there's so much going on in the world that they cannot comprehend fully, cannot understand so much scariness, so much hurtfulness. Think about what your imagination does. I mean, I'm the king of the worst case scenario. I can lie awake all night and never fall asleep thinking about how badly it could go because I'm not talking to someone about something. It is good to talk about these things because it's no fun leaving our own selves to the mercies of our own imaginations. It is no fun living into the uncertainty. Good neighbors communicate. And then some more subtle lessons for Mr. Rogers, ones that went over my head as a child, but watching the documentary and thinking about his work again as an adult are all the more impressive. Mm, that feels good. Oh, there's Officer Clemens. Hi, Officer Clemens. Come oh, in. Officer Rogers, how are you? Fine. Won't you sit down? Oh, sure. Just for a moment. It's so warm. I was just uh, putting some water on my feet. Oh, it sure is. Would you like to join me? That looks awfully enjoyable, but I don't have a towel or anything. Oh, you share mine. Okay, sure. Around the country, they didn't want black people to come and swim in their swimming pools. And Fred said, that is absolutely ridiculous. Today, trouble under a noon sun. Negroes and white rabbis marched to a segregated hotel with these results. Manager James Brock told them to get off his private property, tossed uh, cleaning chemicals inside the pool in an effort to get the Negroes to leave. My being on the program was a statement for Fred. Cool water on a hot day. Hmm. is that television made the world smaller. And so the companion question to who is my neighbor needs to become what is the neighborhood? And for Mr. Rogers, and I think those of us at age five, six, seven, eight viewing him, the lesson became the neighborhood is everywhere. We were drawn together into a community by watching the show in Massachusetts and in California and in Wisconsin and in Texas and wherever we may be. The neighborhood was everywhere and made smaller by our connections through this one show. But you didn't have to leave your neighborhood, your, your geographical neighborhood, in order to make a difference in the world. You could change the world in your backyard. don't have to go to Selma to protest, though thank you to all who did. You can change the world from your backyard just by maintaining that relationship and remembering those earlier lessons that you are special, you are loved, you are enough as you are. No matter who you are, we can clean our feet in the pool together. I didn't understand what was going on in the world at the time that he was doing these things on television, but I sure see what he was doing now, and I know I was absorbing something of the underlying message of the metaphysics of it all in the process. But I think the most important lesson of all, I didn't actually grab from Mr. Rogers until I saw the documentary this past year. Because Mr. Rogers was more than that, like I said, breeder natural goodness that radiated out from the television. Fred Rogers struggled with his own lessons from time to time too, and that story comes out in his relationship with Francois Clemens, who we just saw earlier. Every valley, every valley, 
there were black kids watching the show, they needed a black figure who would not let them down. So if I came out as gay and there was some kind of scandal, that would not serve the race. I carried that all the time. The feeling you know you're alive. Really nice <laughs> red spot. I went to a gay bar downtown called Playpen. Oh, God, that I have a lot of fun. But somebody uh, told the Mr. Rogers neighborhood people about it, and he asked me, Did, were you downtown at that bar? And I said, yes. He said, you can't go back there anymore. I wanted to show this film to you. OK, on picture, picture. Here's Mrs. Clemens at home. In 68, I got married. I'm not stupid. There's the portrait of the king and queen. If I came out publicly, he said, you cannot be on the show anymore. The sponsors, Johnson & Johnson and Sears, they are not going to support an openly gay man. Fred was not prepared to lose that market. My marriage failed miserably, and I discovered you can't pray it away. Eventually, Fred came around to it. Francois Clemens, hi, welcome. Thank you, how you doing? Fine, how are you today? Fine. My feet were tired, so I thought I'd just soak them for a while in this water. Does it make him feel better? It does. Would you like to try? Sure. On the show, he would say, I love you just the way you are. One day, I said, Fred, were you talking to me? And he looked at me and he said, yes. I've been talking to you for two years, and you finally heard me today. And I just collapsed into his arms. I, was, I started crying. I, that's when I knew that I loved him. There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. No man had ever told me that he loved me like that. I needed to hear it all my life. My dad never told me. My stepfather never told me. So from then on, he became my surrogate father. I'm so proud of you, Francois. Oh, thank you, Fred. Thank I you. helped you here? Thank you. Even Mr. Rogers was still learning the lessons from Mr. Rogers late into his life. The documentary towards the end closes with some footage outside his memorial service uh, where the Westboro Baptist Church protested at his funeral because of his acceptance of people like Francois in his life. Sometimes you have to remind yourself over and over again what it means to like someone as they are to tell them they are enough, to know that they are enough, to know that it all starts with love. There's some beautiful symbology that he repeats the, the feet in the pool thing again. Like he had to do that ritual with Officer Clemens once again, once he came to that realization. Some of his uh, creeping Presbyterian ministerhood, I think, coming in there with a little foot washing ritual at the end. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> it is never too late to learn the lessons of Mr. Rogers. Because it's good to talk about these things. The messages aren't just for kids. Although, as we get older, perhaps his style might get a little grating. I understand that. We want to be challenged a little more. We want to ask the straight question and then have Jesus come and say, okay, I'm gonna answer that question, but first I need to tell you a story about this guy. <laughs> but sometimes we just need to hear the direct answer. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of the very simple lessons, hear it in a direct story told to us plainly and honestly, I am angry, I am happy, I love you. I am happy to be in the neighborhood with you. 
Sometimes we all need to hear that. And that is our lesson this morning. May it be so.